This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, not only do I have an extra special guest, but I have a mutual fund legend. Uh, Fidelity Low Price Stock Fund Manager Joel Tillinghast has been there pretty much since inception in 1989. He has absolutely crushed his benchmark over that period. Uh, the S&P 500 has underperformed his fund by 3.7% a year since 1989. Uh, he's crushed the Russell 2000, whatever benchmark you want to talk about. Uh, the low price stock fund now runs about $25 billion. So this isn't a small fund that managed to eke out uh, a couple of basis points. Being 370 basis points over the S&P 500 with that pile of money is no small feat. Uh, Morningstar named him the Domestic Fund Manager of the Year. Uh, Peter Lynch has called him the best stock picker he's ever known. Uh, He's just a legend, has a fascinating career and a fascinating approach to managing a fund. I found this conversation to be one of a kind, and I think you will also. With no further ado, my interview with Fidelity's Joel Tillinghast. Let, let's start with your background. You fell in love with investing as an eight-year-old. Tell well, us about that. Okay. Um, when I was six, my grandfather, who was a bookkeeper accountant at a textile mill, died. And uh, my grandmother was a second-string violin at the Providence Symphony Orchestra, mm-hmm. um, which didn't pay well then, and I suspect didn't pay Well, now. So grandma realized that she would have to live on survivor's benefits and some dividends from stocks grandpa had purchased. He had 25 or 50 shares, mostly 25, of 20 or 24 stocks. Uh And um, he had done research. He kept the annual reports of the companies in a library. And he also used a thing called Value Line. So my grandmother, realizing that this was her source of income, wanted to be sure she had the right stocks. And she got a trial subscription for 29 bucks for 13 weeks of the Value Line. And I was a math nerd as a kid. It was the kind who thought, it's cool that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times eight is roughly nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And the value line has all these statistical patterns. And because my mother and grandmother were looking at these, trying to figure out what was going on. It was curious about the sea of numbers also. She brings you in as an eight-year-old to help her out? No, she she left the value lines around because she was <laughs> studying them. And, you know, and so I wanted to study them. So the first two stocks that I bought were Beckman Instruments and Central Main Power. Beckman Instruments was founded by a guy, Arnold Beckman, who was sort of a tech genius of the time. Um, He made instruments that simplified lab tests and processing. And my dad, who was a biologist, was very attracted to their chromatography equipment, but they made tests that were not possible, possible. So I bought two shares of that, um, (laughs) I think when I was 10, um, and four shares of Central Main Power. And Beckman Instruments got acquired by Smith Klein, which got acquired by Glaxo, but they also did a spin off of Beckman Instruments. So, again, so it came back out to the market and they've held on to all the pieces except Danaher. But the Glaxo shares now have a dividend that's a multiple of the original purchase cost many years ago. Wait, wait, wait. You you bought this half a century ago. Don't tell me you're still long. Yep. Uh, that's impressive holding period. Uh, hey, for for those set it and forget it, uh, I guess on a compounded rate, it's less impressive that the quarterly dividends <laughs> exceed the purchase price because, yeah, there's 50-something years wow. in in the interim. So so let's fast forward to 1980. Your your first job is at Value Line. Tell us a little bit about that experience. 
I had wanted to go to business school, but Harvard saw no need for me, and so did all of the others except for Kellogg Northwestern, Mm -hmm. which would admit me in a year. I hurriedly sent out resumes all over the place, dozens of them, and didn't get anything good. But in the New York Times, there was an advertisement that the Value Line Investment Survey needed analysts. And I thought, I know this job. I know this company. (laughs) And if you ever are looking for a job, they'd say, yeah, I know this company. That's a good sign. So I aced the interview. And instead of getting started at 13,000, they started me at 14,000. I think I wrote up Mary Kay Cosmetics, which was on a tear then because everybody wanted a pink Cadillac. (laughs) Uh, But that lasted for a year. And then he went on to Kellogg for business school. You you come out of business school, you end up at Drexel, also in Chicago? So in the summer, um, I got a job with Drexel in their Institutional Financial Futures Division, headed by a brilliant man, Richard Sandor, Mm -hmm. um, who some people call the father of financial futures. He developed the Ginnie Mae contract, which at one time was a big thing in treasury bond contract. Mm -hmm. Um, Very inventive and creative person. At the end of the summer, he said, would you like to stay? And so I did stay, but I had to take the full-time course load at Northwestern at night classes and work full-time at Drexel. The good thing was we had a 645 morning meeting because we were trying to connect London and Singapore. That was the only time that worked. Yeah. And and so the sort of early-ish start to the day meant that full-time kind of meshed well with evening classes. So I finished up business school um, and started working full time. So so let's talk about how you end up at Fidelity. The okay, the, so the, the urban forward, legend is that you, you cold called Peter Lynch, is this right? Yeah. So why why did I end up at Fidelity? Sandor was fantastic, really like Michael Milken, um, well, despite having limited exposure, but Sandor did work some with him and he did go out to Beverly Hills to see them. But by 1986, they had huge legal problems. And Bank of America called me and said, would you like to be director of research and strategy? Yeah. So I took that. But sort of a week after I started, they announced quarterly earnings, which was the same day is the booze cruise to inaugurate new employees. Mm-hmm. They announced a $640 million loss. And, Ouch. Uh, in 1986, that was real money. Real money. And uh, the division that I was in was below plan. And uh, I realized I want to work with people who are superb, like Richard Sandor, but I also want to work for a company that's not going to have some kind of financial or legal blow up. So I said, unlike my first job hunt, I was going to focus strictly on five people that I thought were at the top of their game. Peter Lynch, Mario Gabelli, Michael Price, Michael Steinhardt, and George Soros. That's a hell of a list right there. Yeah. Um, they have stood up pretty well and have not blown up in any sort of public way. Um, Peter Lynch was famous for the two-minute drill, where he'll listen to any idea for two minutes. He'll shut you down at two minutes, but I think what I said in two minutes was compelling enough that it went on further. And I did have to come into Boston to get seen by everyone and for them to finalize the offer. And uh, even though maybe the decision was made at that phone call, um, I didn't actually know until after the interview you know, the, that I had done it. But when I went to Peter Lynch's office, they dropped me there at two o'clock. And there was all this busyness, mayhem, people coming into the office to quickly tell him about what was going on. And I loved the 
openness to ideas that Peter had and willingness to consider alternative possibilities. I pitched him San Francisco Federal Savings and Chrysler, and I suspect he knows so much more than I did, but those were two of my pitches. Did you get the job because of the stock pitches, or did you get the job because of what he thought about your analytic skill sets and ability to grow? I think he always wants people who can grow because the my my assumption when I'm in the hiring position is you don't necessarily have the developed skills. If you've gotten through the initial filters, you're probably really smart, really hardworking, and either have a degree from a classy school or you have very high grades at a less famous school. But those are just table stakes. What, yeah, what so gets you to ta- the next level? Yeah, and what you want is curiosity. What you want is open-mindedness. I, I think I've never met Ray Dalio, but I would submit that Peter Lynch is more open-minded than Ray Dalio, um, although both aim to be, I think, completely willing to change their opinion when the facts change. And Huh, re- really interesting. So so let's talk a little bit about stock picking. I mentioned the Fidelity Low Price Stock Fund that you've been running is that since inception in 1989. Yes, I, I, let's just talk a little bit about the performance. You, you beat the S&P by 3.7% a year for almost 35 years. It's I uh, started in 89, so what is this? Your 34th you're retiring after 34 years, and you trounce what's really the more appropriate benchmark, I would assume, the Russell 2000. So, And it's ahead of the S&P, too. Well, you beat yeah, the S&P the by 3.7%, and you've beaten the Russell by almost 4.7%, much better. So it leads to the question, what's the secret to this longstanding outperformance against all benchmarks and, and all passive uh, measures? I don't think there are any secrets, but I think there's probably five things. The first is knowing yourself and knowing what method works for you. What are you doing that can add alpha? And sometimes the answer is nothing. In that case, (laughs) I highly suggest an index fund and a different career. And for me, that's comparing price with value. There are three broad categories of process. There is momentum where the decision rule is, is it getting better right now? Um, What's the most current data point that may not have filtered into the market? Then there's growth where you're trying to look out five years and say, can this company grow at an above average rate with above average visibility? And a third approach is compare price with the present value of future cash flows from here to eternity. And I'd say I have one and a half processes. I'm a value investor, but I do look at where do I see the opportunity for above average earnings growth? Where do I see higher visibility? Because you shouldn't say the present value is the same for everything. If you've got a undifferentiated, crappy retailer, and you're saying it's going to have $5 of free cash flow in five years, and you've got Visa, MasterCard, most of the Magnificent Seven, and you say, that's $5, they're not the same. You have so much more certainty because bad things can happen to undifferentiated retailers. There are barriers to entry, there are monopolies for the second set of companies. And so you've got to separate them into those. And so the growth part filters into it. Things get worse at one of the companies that I've invested in. And I look for facts that confirm my bias that it was undervalued. Second set of things sticking to a circle of competence. There are industries that I just can't look out five years and see very well. Biotech or internet, the whole phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, commerciality. For me, 
that's just in, impossible to handicap. Right. Uh, mercifully, Fidelity has a brilliant lady, Irene Kantopoulos, who uh, can do that. I can't reproduce her thought process. I, I can say that it definitely works, but it doesn't work for me. And so part of success in investing is to stick to things that work for you and Stay within your your circle of confidence. Yeah. So uh, you know, Peter Lynch hires you. He 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 mentors you. He's known as a growth investor. You've come to be known as as a value investor. Was it that same thought process? Hey, I'm comfortable with value. I don't want to dabble in growth. Or or did you pick up any of the growth um, strategies from Lynch? Well, that, that, that's what I'm saying about one and a half processes. Your value yeah. with a little bit of Lynch's growth from it. Yeah, saying the present value of future cash flows depends on future growth. And, of course, you want companies whose future earnings and cash flow are going to surprise on the upside five years out. So it would be wrong to categorize you as a pure value investor. No, I, I, the the growth is part of the value. I want the lowest multiple on earnings five years out. And one of the ways that I tried to illustrate that was looking at some of Warren Buffett's biggest hits. And from the time he bought Geico and going out five years, it was two times earning. He paid two times um, earnings five years later. and Stole it. Yeah. And Washington Post, another single digit multiple. And most of his big hits, uh, Wells Fargo, it's like, wow, he he got the earnings growing dynamically or at least above average. And it's the P.E. five years out that, that I think is more helpful than uh, spot P.E. or E.V. to EBITDA today. Huh. R- really interesting. So you began in 89. I'm curious how your investing philosophy has evolved over over the past 30 plus years. I got the black lung assignment as an analyst at Fidelity. Got Me, meaning covering coal? Or? I, got, I got assigned the coal industry and I got assigned the tobacco industry. Okay. You know, <laughs> and ne- neither of which anybody was beating down the door. Coal was suffering then because long wall mines and other productivity improvements had come in in the 80s. And so productivity was growing really dynamically, like 8% a year. The price of coal was falling and because who needs 8% more coal when demand is flat right. or inching up? They, they were still installing coal power plants, but not 8% a year. So the price was falling, whereas the tobacco companies were a – oligopoly of a possibly addictive and at least habituating product. Both industries made me wince, uh, which goes to ESG, but um, your visibility into the tobacco earnings was so much clearer. So if they were both at 10 times earnings, you qualitatively wanted the place where there's and no Harvard Business School Grad is going to say, I want to go into the tobacco business. They don't want to go into the coal business either, but that's a barrier to entry. It's an oligopoly. There's licensure. There's lots of regulations around tobacco. So you have a relatively stable oligopoly, and that's incredibly valuable, which has to be offset by the thought that ever since the Surgeon General's warning, unit consumption of cigarettes per capita until the COVID era had pretty much dropped 3% a year forever since 1965 or whenever the Surgeon General's wow. warning was. It, it, it's been on a downtrend. But the pricing power could more than make up for it. Huh. R- really interesting. So, so let's talk a little bit about how Fidelity thinks about active management and how the low price stock fund came about. There are lots and lots of small cap funds what led to a low-price stock fund? At the time, 
there was a Standard & Poor's Low Price Stock Index, and it was considered a technical indicator of speculation. It's what the much maligned retail investor was doing. Low price stocks were beating the S&P 500. They'd say, it's a crap market. Uh, people are buying junk. Um, the, the meme investor is nothing new right. or meme trader. Uh, also, was seeing that Fidelity had the largest buy side research analyst crew. And we could cover those smaller stocks and the they were mispriced. I also was influenced by a business school professor, Rolf Bonds, who did one of those studies of small cap stocks outperform. Right. You know, for the period that he studied, it did. And it's gone intermittently missing. Um, for many of the last decades since the studies were published. You guys at Fidelity had lots of analysts yeah. that covered this. So you're implying that, A, there's a market inefficiency, yeah. and B, you the, had an, adva uh, an advantage that allowed you to swim in those waters that no one else seemed to do very well in. Yeah. Um, at some point, you'll beat me up for the number of holdings that I have. And 800, 900? Uh, I, I don't something. think, I don't have a problem with that. It, it, but you know, I was going to start with Peter Lynch you know, had more. Was, in Magellan had more in, than 900 Magellan holdings? had more than that. And the assets under management were smaller, although the market, the cap of the market was smaller. But uh, he had more than that. And Peter just, it was unforgivable not to have or get a update on a stock that Peter was interested in. And so I'm thinking, Will Danoff probably intermittently covered over 100 stock, retail stocks, you know, when he was an analyst. And I covered not just the tobacco majors in the U.S., but also the international, uh, British American, and Imperial, and the Canadian companies, and the leaf growers. And uh, so had a full understanding of the international competitive dynamics, but also the supply chain. And that was what Peter wanted, and that was what I thought Fidelity had a competitive advantage because we were doing research on those smaller companies. So, so how does this lead to nearly a thousand holdings in, in a mutual fund, or eight hundred in my case, oh, and over a thousand for Peter? I but by the way, be, I, I'm not going to beat you, you or Peter, up over this because whatever people think about, hey, that's way too many stocks. The answer is, well, just look at the performance. It's obviously not too many stocks. Peter, one of the greatest managers of all time. Your track record, one of the greatest of all time. What does having 800 stocks do for you okay. in that fund? So, so I, I think Peter felt like if you think a business is interesting enough that you want to keep in touch, it's bad form to go to zero. And I sort of feel like the same thing. You you want to keep in touch with management, and if you don't have huge conviction, you want to have a tiny position. And if you've got a wildly diverse industry like banks or savings and loans, you, know, you want to own a few you, you, to you, keep track you, you, as you a benchmark wanna, for the but, sector. But you you want to do a preliminary sort and say, what would a good-looking bank look like? What would a well-managed savings and loan look like? And you want to get to a preliminary answer that says, yeah, the, this you know, 25 savings and loans look like the best of the bunch. And I see it as taking a business card and trying to keep in touch so that you can develop a relationship with management and can understand what is your strategy. And it's harder to have a differentiated strategy 
in banks and savings and loans other than we're going to go crazy with risk, uh, which is not the alternative right. strategy that you want. So so if, if you or Peter own a few hundred of a particular sector, I'm assuming these are very tiny pieces, your, your sub 1% holdings, and it's just a way of keeping track of yeah, or watching a, a sector. If, if, and if, if something starts to work out, that's when you begin to pyramid and add to the position? Yeah, and, and I do that in, in steps. Right. I don't think I've ever gone from a zero weighting to a 50 basis point weighting. On, on IPOs, sometimes you have to do it that way, but otherwise, it, it always takes steps where you want to meet with management a few times, see if they're consistent. You want to see if the financial results continue to be consistent and compare and contrast. Are, are these really the superior banks or am I just getting an index of, of banks? So, so you mentioned index. When we look at active equity, generally speaking, tends to underperform the index, but active bond managers tend to outperform their index because they eliminate the worst of the holdings. They eliminate the poor credit, the, the bad risk-reward relationships, and it makes me ask a question about your alpha. Is it primarily coming from identifying the winners, or are you almost like a bond manager where you're eliminating uh, the worst potential members of, of your yeah, bench? Yeah, adding value by subtraction. You add value by subtracting the stocks that are going to uh, play against your bad behavioral habits. You add alpha by subtracting the industries that you don't understand as well as the market. You add alpha by avoiding businesses that are run by crooks. <laughs> you add alpha by avoiding businesses that are run by idiots that have bad capital allocation or no business strategy. So addition through subtraction sounds yeah, like and, you're and, really getting rid of the worst of the worst. You're, and that's particularly important in the Russell. It's important in junk bonds. I would not want to have a uh, index in junk bonds because the ones with the biggest weight are the most heavily indebted. Right. Wow. Uh, Market uh, cap weighting does not work on the fixed income side yeah, for that uh, exact uh, reason. Uh, uh, especially in high yield. In high yield. Yeah. But yeah, I, th I think it's problematic in um, fixed income. And it's also true in Russell 2000, where 40% of the companies are unprofitable. And that's an amazing and, number. And, and the the ones that I will consider are the ones where it's just a temporary visitor to um, being unprofitable. If it's a cyclical low, yeah, uh, may, maybe um, that's a buy. But if if it has a history of not being profitable, you you really want to exclude that and. Eventually, the historically unprofitable companies will disappoint. Yeah. Like there's only so many years in a row you could do a one-off and, and call it a non-recurring expense yeah. if, it's, and, if it's year after year. Yeah. And the fourth point was to eliminate the companies that are not resilient, which we sort of covered in the last couple of minutes. So, so let's talk a little bit about your cell discipline. Lots of academic studies have shown stock pickers do much better when it comes to buying than they do when they're selling. Tell us a little bit about your sell discipline. If you go in thinking about it as marriage as the Pope would have it, uh -huh. where you're thinking, you know, I don't intend to trade out of this, uh, you're going to make a much better decision um, about that. But facts do change, as Peter Lynch would immediately remind me. If the facts have changed, if the barriers to entry have fallen, if they've made a stupid capital allocation decision, that, that can be a sell. Um, if they 
seem more crooked than we realized <laughs> uh, or more promotional. I guess that's the polite word. That's that's a sell. But it's always a compare one opportunity against another. Despite having a long tail of tiny holdings, low price stock has historically had some very large concentrated positions. Mm -hmm. And those concentrated positions happen because they have high conviction that they're in that group where it's not stupid to think about where earnings will be 10 years out. It doesn't help you to trade from Visa because the stock is a high multiple and you think might be overvalued into that crappy retailer mm -hmm. that I mentioned. You, know, you want to only limit your sell of that type of company to trade into something of equivalent visibility into the future. But if it's a low barrier to entry or if it's somewhat homogenous, uh, can you get me to sell a bank that's selling for 12 times earnings if you can show me an equivalent bank that's at an 8 PE? Of course you can. Uh, they, they probably are approximately the same. And so I'll, I'll be pretty fickle with with those. So, so it sounds like you start out planning on holding to these stocks for a long time. Yeah. If they disappoint you or if there is a um, better opportunity that comes along and, and you're not necessarily thrilled with the holding, you, you'll use that as a reason to get out. What about purely on price and value? When you think about selling a stock like United Healthcare, which I think has very high visibility and good quality management and an unbeatable market position in some places. Do you have the same confidence in the thing you're moving it to? It's a bad trade if you sell that and say, I'm going to move it from United Health to Good Rx, where I'll stipulate that I don't have the same confidence in the outlook. 10 years out. Huh. What about uh, one of your, your biggest winners was Monster Beverage, yep. which, which was started out relatively tiny uh, tiny, and, and not wildly overpriced. And the growth rate was astounding. The visibility on earnings, uh, they grew, but they stayed profitable as, as they grew. What, what allowed you to stay with that company so long? The typical manager would have taken the 3x or the 5x or the 10x and left a ton of money on the table. What kept me in there was the price going in was 10 or 11 times earnings. It was debt-free. Uh, it had a differentiated product. I loved the ambition of the uh, management team um, who were a couple of South African expatriates. Five years after I bought it, the earnings per share were the same as the purchase price. So, wow, if you've done that once, maybe you can do it again unless you think the market is saturated. So, and they kept doing it for quite a while. they kept doing it and are still doing it at an above average rate for a consumer staple. Having 5% unit growth in consumer staples that's sustainable that's amazing. How long did you hold on to Monster Beverage for? I, the fund still holds it. Still, so 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 twelve thousand so, percent. What what sort of crazy numbers are? are? Oh, it's like I'd, I'd have to look at it. It's like a three or four cent purchase cost. <laughs> Thousands of percent gain. That, yeah, that, that's a, amazing. A couple might be a hundred thousand percent gain and, or better. And and you still have confidence that. You haven't seen something that's more interesting in this space you want to replace it with. I, I don't. And and that's that's the problem. I'm, huh. I'm eagerly searching the market, but, but I'm not finding it yet. If, if, if you've got it, please, please do tell. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to give you something to swap out for a 100,000% gainer. That, that, that just... At that point, there's nothing you could do but but uh, 
yeah. uh, I could do, but but make it worse. So so all of this leads to the question: How did you come about to the idea? Let's focus on stocks priced less than thirty five dollars. What what was the thinking? Because we're not just talking about market capitalization. Because you're you you play in different ponds in terms of market cap, but it was the actual price. What what other than the Dow, there really isn't anything that's a price based index. When I started the fund, there was the Standard and Poor's low price stock index. Index, okay. Which they got rid of because they were peeved the we and Royce were using it for a mutual fund. Um, we thought it was free advertising for their index, but I guess they thought that their index was free advertising for our fund uh, or something. Well, the S&P no, gets- or, or maybe the retail market changed so low price stocks were no longer a great indicator of speculation or public involvement in in the market. Well, but, well, but, it, but, it was one of many. Odd lots went away and uh, put to call ratio went away. Like a lot of things that people used to look at as a measure of speculation seems to have fallen uh, out of favor. Um, and yet the low price stock approach continues to be successful after all these years. But what was the thinking? Was it market inefficiency? It, or it, it was that small cap stocks were covered better by fidelity, but it was also looking at Peter Lynch's, some of his big hits, Chrysler and Fannie Mae, which uh, despite its history in the financial crisis, was a spectacular stock in the late 80s um, that made bundles of money for Magellan Fund. And they saw the a lot of those were at the start, under ten dollars, under fifteen dollars, and you know, as the fund grew, the fifteen dollars got raised to twenty five dollars, then to thirty five dollars, and um, is that where it stopped? Thirty that, five. That's where it stopped. Huh. Really, really quite fascinating. So let's let's talk a little bit about the exclusive club that you're a member of. Long term successful active managers. There aren't many of you, why is that such an exclusive club? First, I'd say, why did he use one of the? <laughs> and uh, looking at Lynch. Fidelity, uh, well, you know, Lynch, Lynch, Lynch is awesome, but <laughs> Will Danoff, who actually started within months of when I did, uh, has added more dollars of value than any single fund manager, including hedge fund managers. Amazing track record, just amazing. Yeah, so Fidelity has a strong tradition of active of managers, active managers. Who, have, who have delivered alpha, not just occasionally, but for decades at a time. What makes it, it so hard? It is a very hard game because most people know most things and do you have proprietary information? And are you focusing on that proprietary information? I think Will is thinking very directly about what is the standout winner, the best in class in a growing industry. And those are all he wants. And I've learned from Will um, the. Yeah, if I am excited about artificial intelligence and say, what have I got in small cap? Super micro is not the same bet as NVIDIA, For sure. <laughs> unfortunately. If, if, if you think the artificial intelligence will win and I'm unable to make such a decision, then you want to go with NVIDIA and not super micro. It's hard because information travels fast. And I think at the one hand, can you be faster to react to information? All the bots and automation mean that active managers who are trying to do that have been outcompeted by Renaissance technology or uh -huh. D.E. Shaw or whoever uh, because uh, I, I talked to a employee at one of the quant shops who would 
uh, have to kill me and the employee if if I said <laughs> where it was. <laughs> you know, but he said that at one time, most of their investments were driven by a thesis where they tried to find data to support it. But they've now gone to just pure data mining where if Sri Lanka butter production correlates with the S&P, then they will buy it. Doesn't matter as long as there's It doesn't a- matter. And, and he, being roughly my age um, or a little younger, doesn't like that. But that's the direction that artificial intelligence is, is going. It's, and so I think it's very hard at the fast data. And there's also so much data that people say the amount of data is growing by whatever rapid rate per year. But most of it is until it gets interpreted by something like artificial intelligence. And that's a problem for people who are on the momentum part of the growth market. So, so let's stay with that. There's a quote of yours I, I like. A lot of data, even a lot of the analysis, is trivial and ephemeral. Explain what you mean by that. You, you, you seem to be saying some of this data isn't really useful. For what I'm doing, it's trivial. For the people who've got it, it's got a shorter life than fresh fish, unrefrigerated, <laughs> right. where it's glorious today, but it's it's gone tomorrow. And the, the opportunity is very quick, and machines are very quick to, to reflect those. Whatever you're thinking about, I think Kahneman said, at any particular time, is less important than you think it is, right. but but it's got your attention. And that's the nature of that ephemeral data. Yeah. Huh, re- really interesting. So we're, we were talking earlier about active versus passive. Ironically, Fidelity runs some of the largest passive indexes in the world. What's it like having to compete with your own firm? If we can't beat the indexes, I'd say, we're serving our customers better by by doing that. And if we consistently lag, we, we should shut down the funds and you know, move them all to indexes. But it's really more about customer choice. Fidelity strives to be customer driven. We want to offer whatever serves the interests of our customers best. And and you certainly haven't lagged. You've You've been beating um, your benchmarks consistently over time. Let's talk a little bit about how you define a value stock. What is it that makes a company undervalued and attractive to you? So value is the present value of future cash flows, where you're saying the cash flows 10 years out are a fantasy. Sometimes they're realistic fantasies. But when I think about the Kathy Wood universe, I, Kathy Wood may differ, can't look out for fast-changing industries and say, uh, 10 years from now, this is what cash flows will be approximately. This will be free cash flows in, in an order of magnitude. So present value of future cash flows, where you really believe the cash flows reliability. And Personally, I think most terminal values are BS and that you should discount as far out as you feel comfortable. And the fact that you're trying to bundle it up into a terminal value, unless the assets are cash or convert to cash, that's the value that I am looking for. So since you mentioned ARC, let's talk about overpaying for, for companies. You said it's so important not to overpay regardless of how good any business or company might be. Tell us a little bit about that safe margin of safety that not overpaying creates. Kathy would may have her own valuation, so um, but I can't replicate it myself. Well, it doesn't look like she can either, cause, uh, and, and this isn't a, a beat obsession on ARC, but since in- inception, she's underperformed the S&P 500, including one year, I think it was 2020, where she was up something like 168%. 
if you're up that much in one year and you're, you're still— You're going to pay it back sometime. Uh, it, it seems that, that if you're still underperforming despite that, that may raises a question, are you overpaying for those assets? Yeah. So the question of overpaying, um, yeah, it's, it's why you have to think about how will I react in a tough situation? And if you're a growth investor and you're in a bear market and you bought a stock that is, you think, worth $100 and it's selling for 80 a value investor would say, yeah, that's an interesting upside. You want to be sure there isn't something greater than that. But you get some bad news and the value drops to 90 but the stock drops to 40, right. and there's some growth investors who will say, let's destroy the evidence. Let's sell out uh, <laughs> when it's 40. And if you're one of those investors, know that about yourself. A value investor can feel like, I have to deal with all the clients who say, why are you losing me all this money? Because the stock has gone from 80 to 40. But I feel cheerier because it's a from $40 to a $90 value, that's a much better upside. That's a huge upside, whereas from 80 to 100, that's good upside, but it's not amazing. And it helps me keep an even keel in a situation where I'm feeling the same pain that every other manager is, where clients are saying, why did you lose me all that money? So, so let's talk about making mistakes. I love this quote of yours. You've got to be cruel to yourself so you don't do it again. Tell us about being cruel to yourself. My worst stock in dollars ever was Health South Rehab. I had bought the stock in the teens, and it looked like a cheap stock on adjusted analyst earnings. It had something like a buck twenty nine of analyst adjusted earnings but it had 12 cents of gap earnings. and That's a big difference. That is a big difference. That doesn't sound like your type of stock. Uh, not what it's become my type of stock. They had a dispute with the government where the government claimed that they were overbilling on some cases. And Richard Scrushy, the CEO, was a very... I remember. Showy. I remember that he, name. He, 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 sure. Yeah, and and their investor relations guy had been an actor on the Wonder Years, which was a TV show. I think in that's the a 80s. red flag, isn't that? Uh, it, it's sort of become one. <laughs> yeah, but I paid in the mid-teens and sold it out for less than a dollar. Wow! So and, big and, loss. And, and, and and that's a big and, loss on and, a percentage and, and so basis. Being cr- and it was a lot of shares. I mean, it had complete wipeouts, but they are mostly those one basis point positions where I didn't do the full research and didn't have much confidence behind it, but, but thought it was interesting. So be cruel to yourself. What I didn't do was look at free cash flow. And I think that was part of how my changing, I, I had already realized from the tobacco companies that you know, the magic of their financial model was the huge amount of free cash flow and that they were producing. The gap earnings versus the analyst adjusted, you know, the lack of free cash flow was confirming that gap was probably closer. It turned out that they were um, cheating the government and that there were some accounting restatements necessary and there weren't really good financials and the assets were growing faster than the sales and so which doesn't make any sense yeah and so you you beat yourself up on this you're you're cruel said, to yourself you're cruel to myself to say going forward i'm going to look at free cash flow you know, and take it seriously i'm going to be skeptical about analyst adjusted earnings and look to free cash flow as a confirming but but i also want to see is it one of those cases where the analyst adjustments are economically realistic, or are they excuses? What year was this? I 
bought it around 2000 and it crashed around 2002, 2003. Right. Yeah. Right in the middle of the dot com crash. So you could definitely bury that, although a 99% drop is, is never fun. How big a position was this? Because it, 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 it was material and the. Even with 800 other stocks? This was one of my medium concentrated. Uh, it was probably. Position number thirty, and, okay. and, and that's a percent I, or two, right? That's all that is. Yeah, no one's happy. A ninety nine percent loss on one point one percent could so, be a percent. Yeah, and so meaningful to annual performance. So it's performance. very meaningful, and I, I think I had a you know epiphany about concentration that you don't want to treat all the companies the same. You really only want to concentrate in the very high conviction companies of really superior and clearly Health South was not clear. And so it was beating myself up on, this is how I need to change my analytical method. Uh, this is what's wrong with concentrating in the wrong stocks. Not a lot of managers are nimble enough to make those adjustments 10 years, 12 years into managing a fund. How did those changes affect your performance over the subsequent 20 plus years? I hope that they were positives. For, for the better. Yeah. What, whatever happened to Squishy, by the way? I have stopped watching him like I stopped watching The Wonder Years. Uh. <laughs> That's very funny. So, so let's talk a little bit about picking international stocks as an asset class has done fairly poorly, but it's nearly a third of your portfolio and, and you continue to outperform. What do you see in international stocks? Japan has more public companies than the United States. Hard to believe. Yeah, with a fraction of the population. In the U.S., it's chic to be a private equity or a venture back right. firm because otherwise uh, Yale is not interested in in you. <laughs> um, and whereas in Japan it is prestigious and um, to be public, to be public, to be listed on the TSE, and there are lots of companies that in Japan that earn single-digit returns on equity, but you do not need to invest in them. Mm -hmm. There are lots of brain-dead bureaucratic companies, but you don't have to invest in them in Japan or Europe or the United States. And uh, there the uh, addition by subtraction is particularly important. And it's great that we have on the ground people, and here I'd highlight Sam Chamovitz, who's taking over, along with Morgan Peck from me, spent several years in the Tokyo office. And there are smaller entrepreneurial companies mm -hmm. that are doing differentiated things. One, one of those big winners has been Cosmos Pharmaceutical, which is a discount drugstore um, and food store in you know, southern Japan. And their SGNA to sales, something like 14 or 15 percent. Walmart, which runs a tight ship, has SGNA to sales, I think, of about 20 percent. So we've got a company that is more efficient than Walmart, which I think is impressive in itself. Um, and they pass the savings on to the customers, and customers in the South tend to be poorer than the Tokyo metro area mm -hmm. um, or have lower incomes. So they love the prices, and it's had double-digit returns on equity and good growth, and that's what I look for and what I think Sam and Morgan are looking for going forward. So so when we look at international companies, they've been trading generally at a big discount to U.S. Uh, and consistently for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Why is there such a spread between U.S. domestic and overseas 
companies in terms of your value investor, in terms of straight-up valuation? Some of it is the industry skew, that there are not so many winner-take-all oligopolistic tech companies internationally as there are in the U.S. China has Alibaba, but that has a governance constraint where Jack Ma was hanging out in Tokyo rather than China. Um, And I don't know whether it's because Tokyo is a lovely place to be or uh, because he feared for his physical or financial safety. Um, Not encouraging to... Both of of those are good good reasons, but I, I don't see any tech leaders that are global in a lot of the parts of the world. There are real governance differences in some of the places. Um, and the industry skew away from tech you know, may be slower and more commodity-like. U.S. antitrust policy has kind of gone missing except in weird spaces. And so U.S. companies have a lot more market power that they can use. Huh, re- really interesting. So so you're set to retire as portfolio manager this year. You mentioned your two successors. Um, is the strategy going to be the same, or, or are they going to put their own spin on, on the base that you've created over the past 34 years? They will absolutely put their own spin. Some of the largest holdings have come down in size because what's high conviction for me might not be high conviction for them. Mm -hmm. And on the bullish side, I think research about the specific companies and coverage is better than it's ever been for a low-priced stock fund because Morgan and Sam are beating the bushes, getting analysts to study companies, call companies, visit companies. And so that information flow is better than it's ever been. You're going to stay on as senior advisor. What do you hope to teach the next generation of Fidelity fund managers? Maybe I'm just hanging out um, so that I have an excuse to visit the London office and because I, I learn from them and, and I worry about you know, my mind going soft because I'm not talking to them. I'm hoping I have something useful to to tell them, but if the long-awaited value boom doesn't materialize, they may not want to talk to me. So uh, I want to throw one more quote at you before we get to some of our final questions. You had said when, when discussing what you learned from Peter Lynch, be skeptical enough to spot your own mistakes, be flexible enough to fix them quickly. There's no shame in making mistakes as long as you recognize the mistakes and, and fix them. Tell, tell us a little bit about the process of making mistakes as a fund manager. I, it sounds like you're saying this is part of the process. There's no avoiding error. It's how you deal with it. Yeah, and and that was what I meant to draw from the health health example. The, I, I think it did change my process as, as a result. The, why do I emphasize free cash flow more than analyst-adjusted earnings. Uh, It's because that was so difficult. Why do I emphasize staying away from crooks and idiots? It's (laughs) because of HealthSouth, among others, where... uh, They were both crooks and idiots, it seems. Yeah. So let me throw a couple of curveballs at you before we get to our favorite questions. One has to do with what managers describe as Eating their own cooking. What are your thoughts on being invested in your own fund? I would ask whether the manager can be invested. I have Canadian funds that I cannot invest in because they are regulated under Canadian securities laws, right. and so I cannot invest them. And the low price I, stock I, fund? I, I have the highest disclosable bracket of uh, amount invested in both my personal brokerage account and in my retirement account. So, so you very much eat your own cooking. Yeah. And and our last curveball before we get to our favorite questions, you were affected by your experience in an earthquake in Japan. Tell us about that. It was 
very scary. The conference that I was at went all week. And on Tuesday before the big one, it was in a company meeting. And you know, it felt a tremor. And the translator sort of perkily said, oh, that was an earthquake. Yeah, and I thought, okay, if if you're chill about it, then so am I. Uh, <laughs> and then a couple of days later, on Friday, it was in a meeting with a home goods retailer at the Fidelity office. And the tremors started, and the tea service started to slip around the table, and the company manager was CEO was looking more and more uncomfortable. Not, not chill about it. And not chill. And so I was thinking, oh, it's not just every day for uh, the Japanese. Uh, and so the meeting that was meant to go till four, we abandoned, went down the stairway. The you know, coffee shop in the downstairs was kindly giving away free coffee. And my car ride to the hotel wasn't scheduled to arrive until 4, but it never arrived. Cell phone service had stopped. Wow. And so I had to walk to the hotel, and Dave Jenkins, our fidelity analyst and now portfolio manager, had to walk home, which took a few hours. How, how bad of an earthquake was this? Uh, this was a seven. Five, it, 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 it was a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, you could see the hotel was near a radio tower, an observatory tower. And you could see it bending. Really, you know, and they were going to have a finale dinner at, you know, on the top floor of the hotel, but decided to move it to the basement. <laughs> Makes more yeah. sense. And one of our women analysts was on the 21st floor. I think I was on the 22nd floor. And she went down there crying, and they moved her to the second floor. And if I'm ever there again, I'm going to lose my dignity and start crying and say, move me to the second floor. <laughs> yeah. It's it's very disorienting to be, for those of us... And, who- and to have subways stop, shut down. Cell phone service, shut down. Car service, shut down. All of that stuff. And to see, oh my God, the radio tower is tilting. Um, I can't, my flight was canceled, flight out was canceled. Very, very disorienting. All right, let's jump to our favorite questions that we ask all of our guests. Starting with, what what have you been uh, watching? What have you been streaming? What's kept you entertained these days? It's a good thing that your podcasts have a shelf life because <laughs> some of the stuff that I watch has a shelf life too. Um, I recently watched the Pelican Brief and thought, you know, that was when I really loved Julia Roberts. That's a fun movie. It's a fun movie. Renfield, you know, Nick Cage. It's about. You know, Count Dracula's assistant. Uh, <laughs> so it's lighthearted, maybe more Halloween type showing, but but it, it's fun. I like the Bosch series. I, I, I My like, wife loves that, watches yeah. that. I like old movies. James Bond is, it may be popcorn, but I like popcorn. Nothing yeah, wrong especially with, that. with the Sean Connery. Uh, there, there are definitely some Bonds that I like better. And I'm not quite ready, but you know, hey, this this is the new millennium, and so if his personal pronouns become she, her, then um, I'm, I, I'm fine think, with that. Uh, I don't think we're going to see that with Bond. That that seems to I, be. I, a, there, there was a rumor that. Uh, I'll take the other side of that trade. Okay. All right. If, especially, I, I'm, I'm I'm cool with it. <laughs> um, I just don't see that as a a, a Bond sort of thing. Um, let's talk about your mentors. Obviously, you've talked Peter about Lynch, Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch was amazing. Richard Sandor, what a brilliant and curious and creative person uh, at Fidelity. Bruce Johnstone doesn't get as much press as Peter, but uh, for finding ways to make more than a dividend yield uh, out of dividend paying stocks, he he was fantastic. He He's closer to a value investor than Peter. Th- those are some pretty good mentors. 
Let, let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites, and what are you reading right now? Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a doorstop, and so— But it's definitely worth plowing it, it's through. It's definitely worth plowing through, and took me, I think, nine months to get through. In, in that same category, the new edition of Securities Analysis is— Benjamin Graham? Yeah, Graham and uh, but as edited by Seth Klarman mm-hmm. with some new contributions on like endowment investing, which, which I am curious about because I'm thinking that if Swenson of Yale was around today, he, he might disagree with some of the things that are being done in, in his name. But I wish he was around to, to say I'm wrong. But yeah, so I'm always reading like half a dozen books. A friend last night suggested that I go back to Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And I'm in search of a social history of Jerusalem and the, the country that we now call Israel because it was Palestine under the Brits. Before that, it was the Ottoman Empire. Before that, it was an Egyptian empire for three centuries. So I'm sort of curious as background to the horrible situation in Israel and Palestine. Have you found a book on the topic? The closest? I, I, I have not dropped that in, in a podcast if you find one. I'm trying to remember. Was it the Lexus and the Olive Tree? Was that about uh, the history of, of I that region? I have not, but that might be what I'm looking for. Tom, Tom Friedman, if you go way back. I could be completely wrong about that. My, my recollection is not what it once was. So our final two questions. What sort of advice would you give to a recent college graduate interested in a career in investing or fund management? If you're interested in fund management, you should know that it works on an apprentice system. You do not start as a fund manager. You start as an analyst. I think that's a good thing because it helps you develop a circle of competence. Peter Lynch always stayed an analyst. Will Danoff has stayed an analyst. And even as their fund managers. Even as their fund managers. The second is that it's a demanding job. And I don't think I've had two consecutive days in the last 30 something years where I didn't check stock prices or check email to see what the market was. There there have been days like when my dad passed where uh yeah, I, you, you missed a day. I, I, I missed a day, but I didn't miss two days. And in retirement, I'm looking forward to that. But if you're at the start and you're not ready for that, choose another highly paid, glamorous profession. Um, requires a heavy commitment, you say. It requires a heavy commitment. And, and, and think about what you think you might do. Think about whether you're a value or a growth investor and think about what are my behavioral bad habits that, that are going to hold me back from success. And our final question, what do you know about the world of investing today you wish you knew 40 or so years ago when you were first starting out? Anything can happen. I love that. Yeah, anything can happen. Sometimes in fanta- sometimes you'll be like me and uh, get lucky and meet Hanson Naturals, which became Monster Beverage, at a beverage service at a tech conference. Uh-huh. Then I think of who other than Bill Gates predicted the COVID pandemic. Nobody of note was saying, we're going to have a COVID pandemic. And Bill Gates did not predict that following that, you would have massive fiscal stimulus and... Right. Um, and Followed by inflation. Interest rates. Right. Uh, he did not predict that. So he he was 100% on getting the COVID, but he didn't get that. And anything can happen. Nobody huh. nobody predicted both of those, or at least of note. Huh. Quite fascinating. Joel, thank you for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Joel Tillinghast, manager of the Fidelity Low Price Stock Fund. If you enjoy this conversation... Check out any of the 500 previous interviews we've done over the past nine years. You can find those at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. 
Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Follow all of the Bloomberg family of podcasts on Twitter at Podcast. And check out our brand new podcast, At The Money, where each week we share a quick investing insight with an expert. It's now on Apple Premium Podcasts, and it's coming everywhere in January 2024. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put these conversations together. My audio engineer is Kaylee LaPera. My producer is Anna Luke. Atika Valbron is our project manager. Sean Russo is my researcher. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.